This is chapter 12, lecture part five. So I left you uh, in the last video with the task of looking up your critical value on the F table. So do make sure to follow along and do this on your own and try and find the correct critical value prior to just me giving you the answer. Main reason for this is so that you get practice in being able to do this by yourself. So I told you in the last video that we're gonna use the DF between value that we just calculated um, on the last uh, step two part slide. Um, we just calculated the DF between as, and we're gonna use that as our numerator in looking up our critical value and then we'll, we'll use our DF within as the denominator. So you'll notice that on your F distribution, it has you look at the degrees of freedom in the numerator. That tells you which column to look at. Um, so as I mentioned already, the degrees of freedom between is gonna be our numerator. And so in the last step, we identified that our degrees of freedom, that K minus one um, between, is equal to two. So we had three levels, subtracted one from it, gives us a degrees of freedom between of two. So we're gonna look in the column for two. And then we're also gonna look for our degrees of freedom within um, as the denominator. So the denominator tells you which of these column, sorry, which of these rows to look at. So um, we calculated the degrees of freedom within in the last part of step two. Um, and we identified that our degrees of freedom within is big N, which is the total number of people in our study, which was 12, minus our K, which was three, gave us a degrees of freedom within of nine. So we'll go ahead and use that row of nine, and then the column was two. And so you'll notice that we have two numbers here, one's bolded and then the other one's unbolded. And so we're gonna go ahead and take the unbolded value um, because the unbolded value is the 0.05 level of significance. And we um, established in step two already that we wanted to use an alpha of 0.05. So that's how we know that we're using that unbolded value. Had we been using an alpha level of 0.01, then we would go ahead and take the bolded value. So again, depending on what alpha level you were asked to use or what alpha level you are deciding to use as a researcher, that will tell you which one of those values to use. So in this case, we're gonna use the unbolded value, which is 4.26. So remember that I showed you what our F distribution looks like earlier in that our F distribution um, is a positively skewed distribution and all of, all of the values are positive. So we have no values below zero because it's a measure of two variances. Both of those are gonna be positive. Um, we only have one tail in this distribution and that tail is in the positive side. Um, so we're gonna find our F critical value on this distribution and go ahead and draw that in. So we drew in the line for our F critical that we just looked up, which was 4.26. So just as before, we're gonna shade in the critical region, which is here in the tail. Our critical region is always gonna be the tail that was marked off by that value that we just looked up. So now that we have our critical region established in step two, we can go ahead and calculate the statistic of interest in step three. So remember that, you know, in the previous chapters, we've been using the t-test to test our hypotheses. Things have changed, so we're now using the f statistic to test our hypotheses. So that is what we're ultimately calculating in step three. So remember in step three that I usually like to just write out all of our formulas first so that we have an idea of where we're going. So our ultimate goal in step three is to calculate the value for our F ratio. So I've told you about the theoretical structure um, in previous slides, but I didn't give you the actual formula for calculating your F. So the actual formula we're gonna to use to calculate our value for our F ratio is going to be the MS between divided by the MS within. And so remember that MS is just a fancy way of referring to the variance, right? So it's the variance between groups over the variance within groups. 
So obviously in order to calculate F, we're gonna have to calculate those two values first. So here's our formula for MS between. We're just gonna take the sum of squares between and divide it by the degrees of freedom between. So just like our variance calculations in chapter four, we're calculating the variance here in a similar way, dividing sum of squares by degrees of freedom. The main difference is that we have separated out um, the source of the variance into the sum of squares just between our different groups versus the MS within is gonna look at that variance that's within each of our groups. So to, to measure that, we're gonna take the sum of squares within and divide it by the degrees of freedom within. So if you're feeling, um, you know, extra enthusiastic about calculating ANOVAs by hand, I encourage you to check your textbook and see how you can calculate all of these values by hand. Um, however, for the purpose of this class, and the sake of time and the fact that we are not meeting, um, I am just going to give you the values for these various sum of squares that you'll need. So I will give you the values for your sum of squares between groups and your sum of squares within groups. I'm also going to give you another value that we're going to use later, which is the sum of squares total. So all of these values will be given to you in the question itself. Again, if you want to learn how to calculate these, you can in your textbook. But for the purposes of this class, I will give you all of these values for your different sum of squares. So your sum of squares between that you'll use is going to be 16.17. The sum of squares within that we're going to use is 3.5. And then the sum of squares total, which we will use in a later step, is 19.67. You should also notice that your sum of squares between plus your sum of squares within should also equal your sum of squares total. So that would be a good way to double check to make sure everything looks right. Um, all of those should add up together, and indeed they do. So, like I said, I'll give you those values so you don't need to worry too much about um, the actual calculations of them. However, you do need to make sure you know what they are representing. So remember that the sum of squares in the variance between groups is looking at those differences across your conditions. And then the sum of squares and variance within groups is looking at the differences within each of your groups compared, so the people in each of your groups compared to each other. So you do need to know what theoretically those values are representing. So um, in order to actually solve for these equations, we actually have uh, information in step two that's gonna help us solve these equations. So if we look back in step two, that helps us identify some of these values that we need here in these equations. So remember in step two, we already calculated several different values of degrees of freedom. Specifically, we're gonna need the DF between and the DF within in order to calculate our two values of variance or MS values. So our DF between we already identified to be two, DF within we already identified to be nine. So I'm gonna use those same values in these equations here. So in my equations, I'm just gonna start with the bottom and work my way up to ultimately get to F. So starting with that MS within equation, we'll go ahead and take that sum of squares within that we were given, which was 3.5, and divide it by that degrees of freedom within that we just uh, revisited from step two, which was nine. And when you do the division there, it should give you, once you round it, it should be 0.39. Next, let's move on up to the MS between, which is solved by dividing the sum of squares between by the degrees of freedom between. So again, we are given the sum of squares between, which was 16. 1, 7, we're going to divide that by the degrees of freedom between, which we just saw in step 2, was 2. So when you do out those calculations, you should get 8.09 after rounding. And then next, we can use these two values we just calculated to find our value for our F ratio. So all we need to do is just divide our MS between that we just solved for by the MS within. So we'll take that 8.09 and divide it by the 0.39, and that will give us within an F ratio of 
0.74. So those are our calculations um, that we're going to be using in this class to help us test our ANOVA. So just like in the previous chapters, we take this uh, test statistic that we calculate in step three and we identify the location of that test statistic within the distribution that we established in step two. So we'll take that, that F that we just calculated in this step three, we will take that 20.74 and we'll see where that value is located in that distribution we established in step two. So let's look back at our distribution from step two. Here we have you know, our distribution in step two that we drew. We identified our critical value and then shaded in our critical region. And you'll see that um, this graph, it ends at five. So we actually need to kind of continue that positive tail way out there um, to extend our critical region. This really, uh, the tail goes to infinity. So the tail can be really as long as possible. <laughs> so uh, we'll just extend that tail further out to identify where that value would be located within this distribution, which is really, really far to the right of where our critical region was drawn. So since our obtained value, our calculated value for F is way out here in this far tail, of this distribution, we would say that it is in the critical region. It is in that extreme tail that we had um, established in step two. So since it is way out there in the extreme critical region, our decision then would be to reject the null hypothesis. So our, our decision is to reject the null hypothesis. Our conclusion, on the other hand, is a little bit more complex than that. Because if you remember, our null hypothesis indicated that all of these groups were equal. And then if you think back to what our alternative, so the not, not the null, the other option, the alternative hypothesis, is, it stated that at least one is different. So at this point, all we can say is that at least one of these means is different, but we cannot say which one is different. So we're going to have to revisit the conclusion um, later in a little bit. We're going to have to work on some other things first before we can actually conclude how exactly these groups differ from each other. So at this point, all we can say is that the decision was to reject the null hypothesis, which means that at least one of these groups is significantly different, but we need to take an additional step in order to figure out how. So I'll continue that next step in the next video, talking about post hoc tests.